OK. Good morning, everyone. Very welcome you to attend this forum. The forum is hosted by uh, China Administration of Cyberspace. And the key policy questions and expectations will be discussed around what are the problems and the challenges of online protection of underage users and sharing the experiences and practices of online protection of underage uh, users and how to use the laws and policies to strengthen the online protection of NH uh, users. I'm Zhou Hui from the uh, China Cyber and Information Law Society and also from Institute of Law, China Academy of Social Sciences and very uh, glad to be here. And uh, it's my great honor to introduce the, uh, the, the, the five speakers. And the uh, first one is Mrs. Uh, Yasmina Byrne, the Chief of Policy Office of uh, Global Insight and Policy, United Nations Children's Fund. Welcome you. And uh, her, uh, speak, her speech will around the uh, online and offline protection nexus. And the second uh, speaker today is Professor Zhang Jiyu. Uh, she is Executive Dean of Future Rule of Law Institute, Renmin University, based in Beijing, China. And uh, her topic will be the online underage users of protection, negative content control, and positive uh, guidance. And the third speaker uh, is the Professor uh, Bernd Hautnagel. Uh, he is a professor of University of Munster. He will talk about the protection of minors in media law. The fourth speaker is Dr. Wang Lei. He is the uh, Secretary General of Sina Internet Law Institute. He will talk about the challenge and countermeasure of children's information protection from the perspective of comparative law. And our last speaker is Dr. He Bo. He is a researcher of China Academy of Information and Communication Technology. I will talk about uh, how to strengthen the protection of underage netizens in cyberspace. Okay, uh, I think each speaker uh, can speak for about uh, 10 minutes, but then we will leave some time to uh, discuss. 10 minutes, yes. And uh, okay, now uh, we welcome Mrs. Uh, Yasmina. It's it's the uh, Thank you so much, and, and uh, thank you to the Cyberspace Administration of China for inviting me to speak this morning. I may be actually even shorter than 10 minutes, um, which may leave us some time for discussion as well. So uh, I just want to say a few words about the online and offline uh, nexus and protection of children. We know, uh, we all know that with increased access to the internet social media platforms, online games, children are encountering new forms of risks from violence and abuse that did not exist before the internet. Uh, however, these risks are not brought about only by the internet, nor they exist independently of online risks and offline abuse. When children are harmed, uh, well, children can be harmed by those they do not know and who do they meet for the first time online, uh, evidence shows that most uh, online violence is actually perpetrated by those uh, who are known to the child, friends and peers, relatives and carers. I'll give you just a few examples. The worst forms of child abuse online, such as child sexual abuse images, uh, involves both those who use, share, and store such images, and those who commit offenses against children in real life. Child abuse images that are circulated through uh, online media often depict very young children who do not even have access to the internet and whose carers commit abuse in real life. Recent New York Times uh, article shocked us all by showing how many of such images are still being circulated on the net. Often, very young children and babies are being abused in most horrific ways. 
statistics from the Center of Missing and Exploited Children showed that some 25 million child abuse images are reviewed annually, and the overwhelming number of these images, about 75% of them, are of children below the age of 12. Furthermore, uh, the Behavior Analysis Unit of FBI found that about 38% of cases involved dual or multiple forms of abuse of children um, by perpetrators who possess those child abuse images that were undertaken uh, offline and online as well. When we talk about the older children, adolescent children, for example, who fall victim to grooming, uh, to predators online, uh, and, and people they encounter online, we also need uh, to think about what makes these children particularly vulnerable to fall victims to those predators, and why some children fall victims and some do not. Are some children particularly vulnerable because of their online behavior? Uh, and does online behavior sometime, uh, has something to do with their offline world? For example, isolation, lack of support in family networks, mental health issues, loneliness. Researchers argue that some children are more at risk than others. For example, those who have been um, abused previously, uh, children from LGBTQ communities, uh, children who frequent chat rooms or engage in more risky, risky online and real world behaviors. When it comes to peer-to-peer -peer violence or violence of children against children, uh, when we ask children, they often complain about hate speech, bullying, and harassment. And I, I'm not going to give you any statistics uh, right now because uh, tomorrow uh, my colleagues from UNICEF and London School of Economics are launching the Global Kids Online study that will share more data and insight about what kind of harm children experience online when they use the internet. But what do we know about the reasons behind such behavior? Does it happen because children use internet, uh, because of their use of internet, or is it this behavior grounded in lack of tolerance, empathy, and civility that exists offline, but is mirrored in the online environment? In each of these cases, we need to ask ourselves, are we as adults doing enough to make sure the children's environment, offline and online, is safe, and what role do we have to play to model appropriate behavior? That means that we need to have adequate child protection laws that are enforced, existence of prevention and support services to prevent violence before it happens, and offer rehabilitation services to victims when it happens, and that all actors in society, government and the business sector alike, are doing their best to make children, children's environment safe. There is a lot of emphasis and talk about the role of parents in supporting their children's reasonable and safe use of internet. Parenting mediation practices are most effective when grounded in values and principles of positive parenting in general that foster open communication and trust. One of my favorite studies is a study from 2007 from WHO that examines parental roles uh, and responsibilities of adolescent children. And uh, this study emphasizes five critical roles, love and connection, protection and provision, modeling of appropriate behavior, monitoring and supervision, and respect for individuality. These values can be easily translated into the online world as well. In practice, what it means that parents need to be good role models in their own use of digital platforms, they need to establish connection and trust so that problems children encounter online are discussed openly. They need to enable, uh, undertake enabling and non-restrictive -restric monitoring of internet use. Provide children with adequate resources to use the internet safely and responsibly. And above all, to respect child individuality, so uh, to allow them to develop a healthy sense of self, apart from his or her parents. So, in conclusion, um, only purely online solutions to online violence won't be effective if we do not address offline causes of violence and develop measures that address children's lives, circumstances, context, availability of support networks, and broader family and child support services. 
In UNICEF, uh, we see these as interconnected, and our work on protecting children online is part of our broader work on violence prevention, but also on work with the government and the tech industry to uphold standards and values and shrined in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And coincidentally, actually this year and this month, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the adoption of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So there are several of my colleagues in the audience who can give more examples about how we work with parents, educators, business, governments, and children, including uh, Wen Ying, my colleague from UNICEF China. Uh, and finally, I'd like to say that we need greater evidence and understanding of this interplay between offline and online violence and the causes so that we can offer better and contextualized responses and understand how each of the actors I mentioned earlier can contribute to child safety online. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And, and I totally agree with you that uh, we, when we uh, want to uh, fix out the problems in uh, internet era, we should find out uh, the root cause, whether it is online or offline. If online, we should to find out the online measures. Offline means we should work out the offline measures. Okay, uh, so next will be Professor Zhang Jiyu. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Zhang Tiyu from the uh, uh, Law School of Renmin University of China and also the Law and Technology Institute of Renmin University of China. It's my first time to attend the IGF and I'm really excited to have a chance to share with you some of my thoughts on the online protection of the underage users. Well, this is, uh, we can see this is a, a material I gathered here from the forum. We can see there are children standing in the forest in the sand and wearing virtual reality glasses to observe the nature, observe the world, uh, and get information from cyberspace in addition to the information of the real space. So our children are really born in a fast developing digitalized world. And we see they are active users of internet and digital technologies, the thinking, interacting, learning, and socializing in cyberspace. So that we should really pay attention to the impact. Uh, according to the 44th China Statistical Report on Internet Development, uh, released by China uh, Internet Network Information Center uh, in 2019, there are almost, uh, I, I think, the uh, one fifth of Chinese netizens are under the age of 19, and the total number is about 178 million. So that's a huge number. And we can really pay attention to the impact on children's growth and development from the cyberspace. We see that children of this generation are more independent from parents and teachers, and they are relying on more on internet and peers to uh, get advice or get support than the earlier generations, for example, my, uh, the my uh, generation. And we can see although internet, the cyber space, is really amazing, it may have negative impacts on children. We see many examples of teenagers heavily addicted to online games and even dropped out of school. We also see examples of teenagers committed serious crimes under the influence of online violence, pornography, gambling, and drugs. We also see many side examples of teenagers committing suicides and lost their young lives due to the frauds taking use of their personal information. So we see that Facing these problems, of course, it is unwise to completely block children's access to the internet because the future, their future is just to live in a digitalized world. They should be familiar with the cyberspace and they should know how to take advantage, how to better use the cyberspace. So it is the responsibility of the society to create more clear, healthy, and beneficial cyberspace to our children. 
but it's of course a difficult task. I see there is a basic framework to be discussed on now is firstly, we should provide some kind of measure to identify the children on the internet. And then to, for the children, we should control the negative impact and also promote the positive guidance. Uh, the identification is easier said than done, uh, but the network platforms, they are taking some kind of measures. First of all, they, they firstly uh, try to ban accounts to IDs to identify children, but ID numbers can be easily faked. Then the platforms, uh, some big platforms, they will access the public security authorities database to verify the ID numbers. But we found out that children are very clever. They can easily borrow ID cards and ID numbers from their parents or other adults. So it mm, doesn't work well too. So some platforms are thinking about do uh, performing, uh, for example, fisc uh, recognition testing on adult accounts, which is suspected to be of minors. But this, of course, may be more effective, but also brings some issues to be discussed and study. For example, the issues of the potential conflicts with personal information protection. But although there is a, a, a still studies, but I see many people think if there are trustworthy measures and restrictions on the storage and usage of the related data, it might be a way of to identify children online. Uh, but uh, of course, it's not uh, enough, and so we should also strengthen the regulation of the physical access size of places and equipments. Um, first of all, the parents, kindergartens, the primary schools and middle schools should set up filtering and monitoring software uh, for minors on the network devices and to better protect them. And uh, for public places such as the internet cafes, we think it may be necessary to strengthen the supervision for the minors there. Based on a survey on criminal cases involving minors and the internet in China, uh, which is take, uh, the survey is taken in 2017, more than 60% of the cases are caused in internet cafes, and in more than 20% of the cases, the journal defendants are acquainted with their uh, accomplices or the victims in the internet cafes. So we think it may be uh, a good reason to strengthen the supervision there. But of course, we should provide more uh, terminals for minors to safely get in online. So we should promote more public network terminals for minors, for the children, in more secure and controllable places, such as public libraries and the children palaces, to facilitate the access of minors to the network information, to let them to be familiar with the cyberspace. So after the identification there, first of all, we should control the neg negative impact. I see many governments have made some efforts in this aspect, so I will not talk too much about that. Just some examples. For, for example, the interim measures for the management of online games, it stipulates that online game business units should adopt technical measures to prohibit minors from accessing inappropriate games or game feathers, and limit the gaming time of minors, prevent minors from being addicted to the internet. And also, uh, the regulations on network protection of children's personal information, which were, uh, took a effect this year, also refined some regulations, and I see another speaker will talk more about it. But I, I want to stress here is that in addition to the control of the, the negative impacts, we should also do a lot of research on how to promote the positive guidance. After all, cyberspace is a place that children are very interested to, and they, uh, they can get many impacts from there. As uh, Article 33 of China's Minors Protection Law stipulates, the state encourages research and development of internet products, which are conducive to the healthy growth of minors. 
But on this topic, there is still a lot to study, and uh, there are still considerable different opinions regarding the potential effect of technology, especially IT technology, on child growth and uh, development. And we see that the cyberspace is really attracting, but it may not be aligned with our goal of education to children. There is a interesting book called South Sugar Fight, How the Food Giants Hooked Us, written by famous writer uh, Michael Moss. He wrote in this book that he found out that many research labs of the food industry will more pay more attention to how to make the food more attractive to people rather than how to make the food more healthy to people, more, uh, make people more healthy. So it uh, implies that sometimes the goal of the business is not aligned to the public interest, public value. So it is the government and also the academic responsibility to figure out what we want children to hire uh, with the cyberspace and the IT technologies. So I think uh, there are already many conflicts about the IT technologies and some traditional East culture. For example, in traditional Chinese culture, we believe many activities for children should contain some good qualities and abilities that the society cherishes. For example, many parents in China and I think in uh, some other countries too will uh, let their children to practice calligraphy. It's not just about to let them to have beautiful handwritings. It's more about to let them cultivate some good abilities and good char personal characters during the practices. For example, we believe they can get be more respectful and they can practice to learn how to calm down, how to concentrate, uh, and how to know better of the philosophical concepts of yin and yang and some traditional Chinese culture. So we see there, this kind of practices, this kind of activities, we believe it will be beneficial to children's personal, personal character cultivation and the ability development. So I think it is the time that we should really ask and study what kind of abilities and personal character we want our children to cultivate from using IT products and the cyberspace. And then when we figure it out, we should ask how to better achieve that. So that's so much of my uh, speech. And thank you very much for your listening. Thanks. OK. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Thank you. Uh, I think you give us a very useful <coughs> and interesting uh, introduction of online and age users protection, especially uh, in China. And also, you present a balanced uh, solution on the ground of China's yin and yang philosophy. Very interesting. Thank you. So next uh, will be Professor Burns. Yes. Yeah. Oops. Thank you very much for inviting me. And so, um, I'm the um, I'm professor of law in Germany and uh, doing um, research on constitutional law and information law, internet law, media law, and so on. So I try to uh, discuss more the legal issues or the, if, uh, or the govern governmental issues, the governance issues, uh, because Germany <clears throat> has an interesting approach of um, uh, governance of the internet. Uh, in, in this field, in youth protection, um, there are uh, the uh, European law, uh, so the EU member states are forced to set up um, a legal scheme to protect minors. And each state has discretion how to do it. The um, provisions of the EU law are not very strict in this sense. And uh, what Germany did, uh, and this is now in place since more than 10 years, is to uh, develop a legal scheme that covers broadcasting, so TV and radio, as well as internet. 
Um, and um, th that is, by the way, the only field where this uh, is taking place, because usually if you look at uh, advertisement rules, um, the TV and radio has much higher standards than in the Internet. But in, uh, if it comes to youth protection, the standards are uh, similar. And um, um, how we, do we do it? There is a three-level protection scheme that is, in general, also used in other European countries, like Great Britain and so on. And uh, these three levels are uh, there there is a category of content that is specifically dangerous and that is uh, completely prohibited. Then uh, there, are, um, there is seriously harmful content uh, that is uh, yeah, mostly illegal. I come to this uh, in more detail soon. And there is fairly harmful contents. That is what you just mentioned, content that especially our women groups in Bavaria think that uh, the youth should be protected from. Uh, this is uh, the category which is mostly disputed. I think uh, in Bavaria the rules are more strict than in Berlin if, if it comes to, I don't know, to show nude pictures or whatsoever. So uh, this category is uh, always very much culturally driven. Uh, where there is a clear um, consensus is basically about the content that is strictly illegal. Um, that is uh, first and foremost child pornography. Um, and, but, but in Germany we are also very strict if it comes to Nazi content. Um, this is basically denial of Holocaust or these things is just a no-go. And uh, if you see this in the internet or, uh, okay, I've never seen it in TV or uh, radio, then it will be immediately, um, uh, you will immediately have, have um, the police coming to your home and you are about to go to jail. That's just something you don't do. And um, I think this is the area where it's not worth to discuss. Uh, because the consensus is extremely broad in, in, in Germany. <clears throat> Second, uh, you can dispute this, denial of Holocaust. Um, this is not uh, illegal in, in other states on earth. Um, it, you see it varies uh, to tradition. Second category is uh, where you have seriously harmful contents. That's, for example, um, pornography, uh, acts of violence. In this category, you have the problem that you have to balance the youth protection interest with the interest of the adults uh, to, to have a freedom of information. And um, uh, that is a constitu constitutional issue. Um, and in Germany, at least, you cannot uh, say that adults have no access to, to normal pornography. Uh, but uh, you cannot uh, um, send or transmit pornography, let's say, on the airwaves in the TV, and in, in theory, you are not allowed to, um, <clears throat> to transmit uh, pornography via the web. Um, um, in theory, the idea is that uh, adults should have access to p pornography, but only in closed user shops, um, after examination of the age and uh, of a specific authentication process. In TV it's done, as you know, by a very complex pin code system. Um, and I don't talk about the internet because uh, there is, if you like, a huge uh, implementation gap of all of this. This is probably one of the dark sides of the web. Um, the third level, that is this um, uh, content uh, that is fairly harmful, um, but nobody really knows what this is, and that varies in Germany um, from province to province. And if you go to the north of Europe, it's much more, they are much more tolerant than in Italy or in Spain. Uh, so 
the the whole the, the general idea is um, that there are uh, age ratings and that you just give access um, um, in a different way. Um, people who are 18 um, can see more than people who are 16 and who are 12. You know this system, I think, almost uh, everywhere because this rating system is also used by cinema uh, movies, by, by the film industry. Um, it is, again, very difficult uh, how to judge this constitutionally. One could argue that this clause itself is unconstitutional because uh, there is broad language used um, and uh, here you have the problem of how to balance freedom of speech with youth protections. Uh, that is uh, very hard to answer on a general level. Basically, it has to be done on a case-by-case -case level and then you have to balance both uh, rights, the rights of the children and the freedom of speech. And uh, in Germany, um, the final decision will be made by the courts and controlled by the constitutional court so that uh, freedom of speech will be valued um, uh, importantly. Um, that is the third level. This is, by the way, not very much disputed. I looked up the cases that came up to the administration or to the courts, um, uh, the system works. There is not so much a resistance against this. These the, uh, constitutional issues are uh, important, but they are in practice not a hot potato. Now, uh, and I just have two more things to say. Now, uh, we have a new EU directive, which is now um, um, making the video sharing platform providers liable. So as you know, uh, internet companies like YouTube or Facebook are in general uh, just liable after in Europe a notice and take down procedure. So uh, you send out uh, to Facebook a notice, here is illegal content, let's say uh, pornography. If they know it, they have to prove. If they don't take it out, police will come to them and catch them, send the managers to jail or whatsoever. The, in a very hard cases, yeah. Uh, the idea is then you go to uh, the company. Facebook is, is just one example. It could be a German one too, and saying this is now illegal, and if you don't take it out, you are liable. But uh, in, in, in the first step, these companies are very, very much protected because they are not liable for content of third parties and they don't have to look for bad co and illegal content. That is changing. In this area of youth protection, they have now uh, taken appropriate measures to protect the youth, the platform providers. And that is a new paradigm in youth protection law. I'm very uh, curious of the German legislator how they will implement this. Uh, it's open, I don't know. I do not even know the, uh, the bills. Uh, last point, uh, because um, governance is now uh, so uh, discussed in the internet field, um, there actually Germany took a very, very interesting approach, uh, traditionally ex actually, we, we used it in broadcasting. Um, all this content control in youth protection area is um, traditionally done by self-regulatory bodies, basically the industry. That is the same in Britain, for example, because they do also the age rating for movies in the cinema, for films in the cinema. And um, so they have a lot of experience. So um, the, the, the governance system works as follows. Industry forms self-regulatory bodies for the internet as well. And if there are problems, uh, this self-regulatory body has to make the first decision. And only if you have very severe cases, um, extreme cases, let's say one out of 100, the formal uh, state uh, agency that is responsible for youth protection will step in. So in practice, basically, uh, the majority of cases is done by these self-regulatory uh, cases, and they are somehow supervised by 
basically it's our broadcasting authorities, even in the internet field, uh, so these independent regulators like the, 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 the American FCC, and if they find that they are not doing a good job, then they step in. Or if somebody sues and forcing the agency to look at these cases more closely. So, in general, I looked up uh, the cases um, that are uh, dealt with our independent regulators. Um, I think they are just 300 cases per year, so it's not so much. Germany has 80 million people. Uh, this area is heavily disputed. Um, it's, 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 it's not so much uh, than, than, than I expected, yeah, because I didn't look up the statistics for a while, and then I thought, wow. So, but, but in general, if you look up the literature or look in the news, this whole system works now for 10 years, and I haven't heard any uh, fundamental criticism into this. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Byrne. And I think you give us a very uh, specific introduction of the three level uh, protection of uh, and age in, in Germany and its uh, mechanisms also. Uh, I think it's very useful. Okay, let's uh, go to the next speaker, Dr. Wang. Please have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Zhou. Uh, I'm very pleased that you have this opportunity to participate in this forum. And uh, with regard to the protection of the internet uh, and uh, personal information, uh, especially the children's personal information. Uh, my presentation is about the challenge and uh, countermeasure of children's personal information protection from the, the perspective of comparative law. Uh, like the introduction, uh, before the, the development of the internet, uh, children's living environment was mainly uh, con concentrated in family and schools. But uh, with the popularity of network technology and the mobile smart devices, more and more children are beginning to use the internet. According to a report on children from United Nations in 2017, one third of the world's internet users are children. And more than uh, 175,000 children worldwide access the internet for the first time every day, with an average of one child per second. And the order of the network environment is based on the soft discipline and the responsibility. And the general situation does not include age-based differential treatment mechanisms, so it, it posed a, a great risk to protection of children's, uh, children's personal information. And my uh, presentation is divide, divided four parts. Uh, the first one is about the, the necessity of the protecting children's personal online information. And the second one is a comparison of children's information protection system among United States, China, and the European. And the third one is uh, the common problems in children's information protection system in different countries. Uh, the, the last one is uh, about uh, the legislation in China, children's personal information network protection regulations. Uh, here is the, the Children's Personal Information Network Protecting Regulations of China. Like the, the uh, Weibo.com, uh, like the Facebook, uh, we have uh, some, uh, some information like the favorite prefer uh, preference, uh, social network, residence address, education background, some others, and by uh, register and uh, application account. Uh, about the comparison of children's information protection system, uh, we have divided some, some parts like the United States. Uh, the example in the United States is the COPA. 
uh, related acts and scope application, uh, any websites or online service operators for children. Uh, children refer to minors under the age of uh, 13. Uh, two categories is the, the children oriented and the non children oriented. Uh, here is some, uh, some specific uh, regulations as follows. Here is also the, the COPA. It's also required when the website or online service is not intended for children, uh, but actually knows that personal information is being collected or maintained for, from children. Uh, this one is about uh, uh, the, the, some legislation in China. On May uh, 31st, Children's Personal Information Network Protection Regulation uh, draft for comment is published, and uh, on August 22nd, uh, Children's Personal Information Network Protection Regulation is published, and uh, the regulations apply to activities such as collecting, storing, using, or transferring, and uh, disclosing personal information of children through the internet within the territory of the People's Republic of China. And the children refer to minors under the age of 14. About the uh, com compliance requirements for network operator like this, the, the COPA is need to uh, explicit rules and uh, uh, are favorable parental consent and the people's parents' rights to review and reject some ideas here. And uh, in China, uh, we also have some the requirement for network operators, uh, like the regulation in China adhere to the principle of the network safety, uh, personal information protection re requirements, agreed a voluntary standards, the personal information security standard of the information security technology uh, in the children's personal information, uh, belong to the sensitive personal information. Here is some ways uh, to obtain uh, parental consent in the United States and in China. In China, the regulation in China adhere to the principle of the network safety, personal information protection requirements. And uh, in addition, the provisions also further refined on the basis of the information security technology, personal information security standards, mainly including network operators are required to set up spe special protection rules, uh, design designated person in charge, specify the scope of specified matters to be informed to the, the guardian and obtain the express consent of the guardian and provide a refusal option. Uh, here is the, the, the GDPR in EU also uh, Give the special provisions on children's information protection. Uh, it has the digital age, uh, refers to the, the eligibility of a child, of child to give consent and authorize others to process personal data until a uh, certain age. And uh, GDPR's special provisions on children's information protection is also about the right to be forgotten and uh, uh, about the automatic processing of children's data is uh, prohibited. Uh, about compare with the, the, the legislative about the United States, uh, the Europe and the China, uh, we also have some common problems about the children's information protection system. Uh, the first one is uh, reducing the, the experience of children's online servants and uh, continually reverse the discrimination against the children's users. Uh, like the, the new rules, uh, the comments about the Google uh, on the COPA, 
they said that new rules which define personal information about children uh, too broadly will limit the ability ability of operators to maintain and develop children's products. And then the second one is also the common problems that is the high social cost of identifying children's age and opting a guidance consent because it's uh, uh, very difficult and uh, to the practice and the the driving network operators who deny services to children or allow them to lie about their age, like some children uh, use their internet uh, to, to lie their age. And the problem uh, leads to excessive data collection and uh, significantly increasing unreasonable uh, social cost. And the third one is about uh, uh, the platform responsibility, the sharing of platform responsibility and guiding responsibility, because uh, the guiding consent system is not operable uh, like the, uh, the safe harbor and uh, the security privacy authorization system of the United States uh, and uh, uh, the authorization about the, the sharing of the platform responsibility. Uh, responsibility. Uh, here is the, uh, some, suggest, some suggestion and uh, some introduction about uh, children's personal online information, how to protect in China. Uh, like uh, as well, I uh, just said, that the children's personal information network protects and regulations of China. Uh, is the first uh, domestic legislation for the protection of children's personal, personal information. And uh, in line with international standards, it slaps five principles for children's personal information network protection. Uh, it contains the multi-agent cooperation to protect children's information and uh, give the, the internet company six compliance requirements for for how to, how to deal with the children's information. Here is the, the, six, the six compliance requirements for, for the company. The first one is uh, the children information protection uh, commissioner. It should be set in the internet enterprises and uh, need to uh, specialize the privacy protocol for child and uh, give the, the strictly restricted internal access and the safety assessment of children data. Uh, some, special, uh, some special provision like the children's personal information shall not be disclosed except under special circumstances and the, the, the guiding of the child shall have the deletion rights. And uh, in my opinion, uh, under the trend of globalization of the data economy, uh, as internet company like the Weibo.com, uh, we should re-examine business practice and the sort of internal personal information security uh, and uh, build a, a best practice about the, the security protection system. And that is my presentation. And uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. OK, thank you. Thank you for your co comparative analysis among uh, America, uh, EU, and China. And also uh, give us the common problems and your suggestions. Then next, go to our last speaker, uh, Dr. Herbo. Uh, thank you. Uh, dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. Uh, I will be very brief. Uh, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to appreciate our session organizer, Cyberspace Administration of China. I feel very privileged to be invited to this forum to address you on this topic of working together to protect underground, underage users in cyberspace. 
This is a new experience, but I do believe that the topic we are discussing in this conference is very important. Uh, the year 2019 marks the 70th anniversary of the founding of People's Republic of China. It is also the 50th anniversary of the birth of the Internet and the 25th anniversary of China's connection to the world Internet. The Internet is changing the production and life of human beings and driving social and economic development. And thanks to the Internet so that we can have this conference here. Uh, with the 25 years of rapid development, China has quickly become an internet giant. Here, I would like to share some information about China's internet achievement for the past 25 years. Firstly, the network infrastructure is continuous upgraded. As we can see from the report, that by June 2019, there are 396 million people received fiber to home service and accounting for 91% of the total number of brand users. And at the same time, China has more than 50,000 blocks of IPv6 and ranking first in the world. Uh, secondly, the number of the netizens continues to increase. This year, the number of Chinese netizens has reached 840, 50, 854 million, an increase of uh, 25 million from the end of 2018. And also, thirdly, we can see that digital economy in China is developing very rapidly. China has promoted the application of the internet in the whole society, especially for e-commerce and the internet uh, information service. In 2018, the scale of digital economy has reached uh, 31 trillion RMB, accounting for uh, 35 of the GDP, the digital economy has become a new engine of the economic growth. And uh, in recent years, with the rapid development of the internet, the number of Chinese underage, underage netizens has been expanding, and the cyberspace has become a new space for the protection of manners. According to the report from the CINIC, by the end of 2018, the number of underage netizens in China was 169 million, and the internet penetration rate of minors has reached to 93.7%, which was significantly higher than the internet penetration rate of the national population during the same period. At the same time, Chinese underage netizens have more choices for the internet devices than the overall internet users. According to the survey, there are more than 92% underage netizens using mobile phones, and 48.7% using desktop computers, and the number of the using TV and tablet to access internet are both higher than the overall internet users. The development of the internet provides uh, infinite possibilities for the growth of manners, but at the same time, the protection of manners in cyberspace is not enough. The survey found that one and a half of underage users was, were exposed to illegal information, such as gambling, drugs, as well as violence, when they suffered the internet. In addition, there are also in, inappropriate information of fighting and robbery. So the control of this illegal information in cyberspace is still worth of, worth of attention. Uh, in the past few years, Chinese government had attached a great importance on the online protection of manners. According to the cybersecurity law adopted in 2016, the state supports the research and the development of online product and service beneficial to manners health and punish the usage of network to engage in activities harming the physical or mental health of manners, which aim at providing a safe and health online environment for underage users. Uh, as just now, Dr. Wang Lei mentioned that on August 22 this year, the CEC released the regulation on the protection of children's personal information online, and it went into effect on October 1st. This is the first legislation in China aimed at children's online protection and it set out very strict requirements for the network operators if they connect, storage, use, or transfer, or disclose the personal information of minors under 14 years old. 
Uh, meanwhile, China is highly concerned about the international cooperation. Uh, in 2017, under the guidance of CEC, China Youth Federation, UNICEF, and CICT hold a special forum themed Seeking Guard of the Future, uh, online protection of underage users. And there are more than 100 uh, government officers, scholars, uh, representatives from international organizations and internet companies from all over the world were invited to share the experience of online protection of underage users. Uh, in closing, I believe that we have much, of, much things to do for this important issue. Internet has no boundaries. Online protection of underage users is a common issue all around the world. Strengthening the protection of underage netizens needs a joint effort from all the stakeholders. Here, the government, society, enterprises, schools, and families should take all, all take the important responsibilities. Only with the cooperation of all parts can we effectively protect the manners well. Uh, thanks for your attention, and have a nice day. OK, thank you, Dr. He. Uh, thank you for your introduction, uh, both achievements and uh, uh, the measures in China. So maybe we still have uh, four and a half minutes. Uh, any comments or any questions for our speakers? Uh, if you have any question, please hand up and uh, give a very short uh, comment or question. Thank you. OK, please. Uh, th can I go ahead? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. I have a question for the last presentation. Uh, by the way, I'm Anjan Bose from UNICEF. Um, you presented um, the type of content that is uh, deemed illegal, and violence was one of them. Just wanted to um, you know, have a little bit more detail on what type of violence that entails. Does it also include? Uh, issues around child sexual abuse material and related content. For you, Dr. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, I just uh, found this uh, data from uh, a report online from uh, CINIC. Uh, if you want some details later, I can find out the more details and I will share with you. Thank you. Okay, next gentleman. Hello, my name is Abhilash Nair. I'm from Aston University in uh, Birmingham, UK. Uh, my question is for Professor Holznagel. Um, you talked about age verification in the context of Area Mass Directive and what Germany does to protect children from exposure to uh, pornography. I wondered, I know it extends to uh, websites that originate in Germany, i.e. with the .de domain name. What does that you can do for sites that originate elsewhere in the US, for example, which is where most of the content actually come from. I think this is um, more a question of implementation of the law. And um, maybe one is not strict enough to go against this. Um, I'm, um, maybe um, that somebody has to sue against these sites and then just to prove uh, what will happen. Um, we always have the problem if you put content to sites and servers outside of Europe because, uh, as you know, the legal system is quite different and um, first of all you have um, areas in the world where um, there is nothing more than the state or there is no power that controls um, these things. Or maybe they have other things. Uh, to do because it's civil war or whatsoever. And uh, then you also have countries with a completely different legal system. And there, uh, Europe can nothing do. Uh, I think that is uh, how things work. Um, so I have not a real answer. Um, if you really would like to go against this content, you have to use filters. But this is extremely... Uh, problematic too, and um, I don't know, are you aware of this debate we just have on using filters on in the copyright world? Uh, you have seen how many problems and conflicts this uh, caused, but uh, if you ask me 
frankly, what I'm thinking is that probably this model um, protecting copyright law will be in the long run copied for, let's say, youth protection or um, um, protecting um, um, honesty. Uh, and that would mean uh, that uh, you use these devices um, in a controlled way and maybe uh, that you also give uh, law firms uh, the possibility to go against this type of content and make out a business model. Uh, this was indeed uh, very efficient in Germany uh, because when all these law firms started to go against uh, infringement of copyright law, there was a tremendous reduction of this. Yeah. Maybe it's not always the state or civil society who can resolve problems and one has to think, think more innovative. But this is, from the constitutional point of view, uh, it's a very, very um, difficult situation. You always have to balance and you have to make really clear what is your focus um, that you want to protect. <clears throat> Okay, uh, our time is up, and uh, thank you very much for your attending. And we have to come to an end of uh, our discussion here. But uh, you can, if you have any further comments or questions, you can direct uh, uh, talk to the professor or other other uh, speakers. Uh, and thank you, thank you very much. Hello everyone, you can uh, remain seated for the next session which starts at noon, if you don't mind. <laughs>